And we're also grateful to have, again, a longtime friend, uh, Brother Antonio and Sister Hilda. Amen. And just happy to be in town this morning. And, um, and he said, hey, we all want to miss church. And so I gave him the address and here they are. But I'd like to, for Brother Antonio, he's agreed to say a little greeting, to say hello. Amen. I, I don't realize that when I first met this brother, come up, brother. Yeah, how are you? He and his wife came for, uh, to get married. And I had some premarital counseling with him. I had no idea that he had no desire to be married by a religious guy. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Otherwise, I probably would have been intimidated. But say hello and, 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 and maybe tell a little bit about yourself for those who don't know you. Thank you for having me here, Pastor. Yeah, I want to say thank you to all of you. I see some new faces and some old faces. My story, my life, it always has been good. But I've been going mostly in my life, even to having a good life. Mostly it was always difficult life. It is just that we don't notice how hard life is and we don't have problems. So, before I met my wife, I came out of a 30 years relationship. What I was thinking, it was a wonderful time. I do have two that relationship, break other relationships, like with my parents, with my brother, with my relative. But I wasn't on the top and I was thinking, this is life, life is wonderful. Mm -hmm. I remember my father telling me, this is not going to end good for you. And I said, ah, who cares? Everything is wonderful. And it do happen after 30 years. And I went from having everything to have nothing. My life was a box. And I think that box was from D&D, &D, as far as I remember. <laughs> So, <laughs> very small box, <laughs> and that it was I was left after 20 years. No money, wow. a friend had to took me in, and basically he feed me for a couple of weeks. And all of a sudden I got a job, and things started moving up, but I was not happy. I was not happy to be alone. So I started praying for the first time in my life and asking, dear Lord, is this what you want from me for the rest of my life? Being alone, don't have anybody to share. And somebody who was eight and a half thousand kilometers away from me was actually praying the same. Yes. And we got together to my brother-in-law I had to marry and I was looking for the wedding celebrant. How lucky I was, there was none available. So somebody was giving me Pastor Don's address to talk to him. And I remember I was told that was uh, Cecilia actually who gave me that address. And he was telling me, oh, don't worry, my pastor came in the parking lot. I said, great, I love that. Yeah. And, uh, I was thinking, what is your pastor? He said, oh, Pentecostal. I said, Pentecostal, what? He said, you know, born again. I said, oh my God, it's a crazy. <laughs> I don't want anything to do with that. So I chose the paper. Literally, I chose it. But time was running out. And uh, my wife was coming from the Philippines and we had to get married to fill up the papers. So I went back to Cecilia and said, Cecilia, I forgot where I put the paper. Can you give me the address again? Did she give it to me again? So I contacted Pastor Don. And I remember he was telling me I have to come to church. And I said, oh gosh, I don't like the church. Really? <laughs> and what you can do, all you do for love. So, okay, let's go start going back to church. And I was very welcome in church. And finally my wife came and she started coming to church and what I noticed is how fast she embraced it, but how hard it was for me to embrace it. 
Anyway, Pastor Don said, no worries, we can marry you, I can do that, but you need to do counseling. And I jumped right away and I said, oh, look, I don't need counseling, I've been already married, I know what's going on. He said, look where you are. And I said, okay, good, yes, right, something like <laughs> this. It's not what I was thinking. So we went to the COVID counseling and Pastor Don came and said, okay, so next week is your wedding, but before you go marry, I want to baptize you guys. Again, I jumped and I said, sorry, Pastor Don, but my, my wife comes from a Catholic line, and my wife jumped too and said, yep, yeah, we go, we go, we go and baptize, no worries, we are baptized, and I said, oops, what's happening? So anyway, we were baptized, and I remember that day I was baptized, Pastor Don was sitting in the back of my car, and I said, Pastor, I feel like I lost 200 kilos out of my body. Amen. So I do believe that when you get baptized, your sin washed away. Amen. Amen. So that's how I was feeling. It's a lot of grief that I was baptized. And since then, my life has been going up, downs, up, but more up than downs. Downs is something normal in life. What we need to understand, and this is what I am trying to, be, to tell you, is we don't pray to God asking for wealth. I mostly pray for people who have needs. I pray for my family. I don't pray, oh dear Lord, I need a new, new iPhone, or I need a new car, or uh, uh, can you provide me to go on holiday? The Lord is not there to provide us these kind of things. We need to pray Him and praise Him, ask Him to help people. Not for yourself. He knows what you need. He will provide you what you need. So most of my prayers are never for me. It's always for my family, friends, relatives. When COVID kicks in, most of my prayer was for all these people who pass away, even though I don't, I don't know them. But it was somehow embracing me. I, I love it to do that. So keep that always in mind. Never pray asking for wealth. Ask to help others. Ask to give to others. That is something He will provide you with. He knows what you need. You don't need to tell Him. He knows it very well. So He will provide. In other life example I can give you, I came this year, 1st of January, from holidays, and I was told, you know, you're not gonna have the job you have anymore. And I said, oops, who's gonna pay the bills? And for the first three days, I could not sleep until I realized, oh, you're doing something wrong. Stop thinking about it, leave it up to him. Amen. Amen. A couple of days later, I called a friend. Hey, how are you? I just wanted to say, how are you doing? How's family? And he said, how is work? <laughs> and I say, oh, you know, I'm running it. Don't worry. I will provide you with something. <coughs> and this is the meeting I had today. And then I start asking to myself again, why are we all the source of trouble and going backward? We know already what is in front of us, basically. Yes, just move to it. Forget the past, forget the negative thinking. I know it's very hard to do it. Because the, the outside keeps influencing us. And we get tempted every five minutes. I'm a person who until today, I don't have to get under control. I'm not going to say anger, but I get very easy frustrated with things. And what I do is, yes, my wife knows that. I keep quiet, I don't want anybody to talk to me, and then I start thinking and going over it, way over it, until I relax and calm down again. So self-control, you pray for it, you will get it. So I hope this help give you an idea how is my life. My life wasn't always good, but since I met the Lord, it has been good.
They say in the workplace, it was noticeable. This was a different man sitting behind your table. Amen. It was noticeable. And then he moved to Newcastle and his wife and the boys. And I got to be their pastor still. And then he moved down to Campbelltown Way. And uh, so now they go to Sister Anne's Brothers Church. Uh, Pentecostals of Campbelltown. And I, I love being able to stop by and see you grow and see you catch up with you. Amen. I just love this couple. And the boys are growing up nice and tall. Amen. And strong in the Lord. Today, this is called Time to Take Your Temperature. And we're going to go to Revelations chapter 3. Revelations chapter 3. Now, we had family camp recently. One of my favorite parts of family camp was the campfire. Amen. I love a campfire. And about two or three years ago, I went camping with my friends Fong and Brother Clive and um, Lance White. And the highlight of that, we did lots of trekking, and that was cool. But we spent most of our time sitting around a campfire. I just love campfires. Now everyone, when you get a campfire going, everyone goes and grabs a chair and gets a front row seat to watch the fire all night long. Even when the smoke blows directly at you in your face for a few minutes, you just kind of hang in there thinking, okay, maybe the wind's going to change, but this is worth it. This is worth it. Now, why do people love campfires? You ever thought about that? Fire. Why do we like campfires? Well, one thing is it keeps the mosquitoes away. The heat's too strong, the smoke repels them. That's why you don't mind if the smoke gets you, because you know that in the cloud, while you're there, you're totally impervious. No mosquitoes are going to be working on you. Now, like watching TV, it's exciting to observe the flames and the wood. I mean, that is the TV of the, of the natural world, is fire. That was the first TV. Amen. And you get to see, you know, little sparks here and, and a flame shooting out there and maybe a, a blue flame or maybe an orange flame or something pops out. Um, it's fun. It's a conversation starter. While you're gathered around, people just start sharing stories. Hey, that reminds me of something. That's how Americans begin their storytelling. That reminds me of something. What do you mean it reminds you? No one was saying anything. But, uh, yeah, it just starts. People just start talking. That reminds me. And they start telling stories, and they start telling jokes, and they start trying to outdo each other. It just gets the conversation going. The heat is a refreshing gift on cold nights. Yeah. Now, fire is real. Unlike TV or that digital music stuck in your ears, or even books and computer games, fire is real. I mean, fire changes things. Fire takes command of whatever you put inside its domain. Fire demands respect. Amen? That's why whenever you're, like, you're a pastor or if you're in charge of a school outing and there's going to be a campfire, you've got to put together, you know, a risk assessment. You're, you got duty and care. You, know, you can be in jail over this if you don't do some, everything right. Now, I believe Christians should be on fire. Amen? Amen. Christians should be on fire. Christians have been saved. Amen. So we need to be noticeably transformed. There needs to be something different about you now that you're a Christian. Amen. And that's an indication that you're on fire. That something noticeable changes. Amen. Christians have been equipped. We should be the ones making a difference in life. I remember before I became a Christian, some of the more significant people that I remember in various areas of my life were Christians. They were changers. They changed the attitude. They brought maturity. They, they brought reflection. And I remember one guy actually got me to think a little bit less of myself before I became a Christian. And I found out later he was a Christian. He actually kind of helped me rise up a little bit and be a bit more selfless and a bit more giving. Christians, we've been commissioned. So we should be reaching others. In all three aspects, I believe Christians should be on fire. Because we've been saved, we should be on fire. Because we've been equipped, we should be on fire. And because we've been commissioned, we need to be on fire. Amen? I tell you what, you should have seen CJ on Friday. 
he was on fire, amen? And they had youth, amen, and youth on Friday night, was it this Friday? It seems like it was a month ago, was it two weeks? Okay, <laughs> it was like, yeah, about maybe 10 days ago, we had a youth, it was supposed to be a games night, and Jason says, no, we're gonna have some, we got some things burning in our hearts we gotta share. Jason shared and CJ shared. And I thought, well, you know, I'll just let the youth have their time. I'll let them have their independence, their autonomy. Their... And I thought, wow, this is too good. i got to watch this. It was, he was on fire. I'm really proud of you, brother. That was some great preaching. You're preaching from the heart. Amen. And preaching from the, from the anointing. Amen. I don't want you to get a big head, but I was, your pastor was very proud of you. Amen. We need to be on fire. Now, I ask you, would God and his angels like to grab some chairs and sit around Northern Beaches Pentecostal Church and watch us burn like a friendly fire? I'm hoping so. I'm hoping so. And not just during church services either. If you can sort of like, you know, put all of us, because we're scattered, if you can put all of us together on this little God vision in a little circle, you know, and say, you know, during the week, look at these guys go. These guys are burning. I can snap, crackle, pop, and, and they're changing things and they're, and they're making a difference where they're planted and the angels saying, yeah, look at this one over here and, and look at this one over here. Would they be doing that? And if not, you know, can we be that way? Can we try to be that way? I know that you might be alone. You don't have your, uh, your inspiration or the challenge or the comfort of your brothers and sisters, but when you're alone in the workplace, can you be on fire? When you're at school, can you be on fire? When you're shopping, can you be salt and light? And I think we can. Maybe we already are. Again, I don't want to turn this into a self-loathing kind of service, but I just want to remind you, when we leave the building, amen, we are still the church, and I believe we still need to be on fire. And I say, turn up the heat, brother. Amen. Turn up the heat, sister. We can go out there and we can make the devil nervous wherever we go. I want the devil to be nervous. Amen. So today's question is, are we on fire? And are we interesting to God and the angels? I believe it's time to take our temperature today. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I feel, Lord, a spirit of agreement today. I believe everyone's with me, Lord Jesus. We do need to be on fire. And Lord, if there's anything we need to do to help us to, to secure that it's really there, Lord God, that we really are doing what we got to be doing and encouraging us, Lord God, to learn how to do what we need to be doing. I pray that today this sermon will be that that solution, Lord God. Help us, Lord, to hunger to be there and help us, Lord Jesus, to make it. Help us to be that church on fire, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So by now, hey, let's play the clap for the Lord. Amen. But that's good. If you give us the good wake-up call. Amen. But by now, you had time to find Revelation chapter 3 if you're using your Bible. And I hope that you are because I love you getting close to your Bible. Amen. This is one of my, my Bibles. All my all my Bibles that I've used over several years have become my church Bibles. Amen. And so we're going to go to Revelation chapter 3. We're going to read um, one whole message to one whole church. You know, in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation, God gives seven messages to seven churches. And this is the last one. Amen. And in verse 14, to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, right, he's talking to John. These things, says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, basically Jesus. I know your works, that you are neither hot, you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Those are some pretty strong words. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, that sounds like a modern day, isn't it? Because we've got medicine and doctors and lawyers and, and the government and, and policemen and criminal systems that, that are not corrupted as bad as other countries. We say, I am rich, I've become wealthy and I have need of nothing. And you don't know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, 
and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. And so that's the message he gave to the church of Laodicea. Amen. Now this is my reading. At the moment, I'm actually reading through the book of Revelation. You know, people, when they commit themselves to reading the whole Bible in a year, sometimes find themselves reading the book of Revelation in January of the next year. Amen. And so, you know, and I believe it's not just chance. I believe that God puts us in places for the right time. Have you noticed that you're reading the Bible and you're reading a passage that's just for that period of time? And you wonder, how did God time this so well? I needed this, Lord. Amen. I see people nod their heads because they've been there. You need to be there too. You need to read your Bible on a regular basis and you'll find yourself having that exact same experience. No matter where you're reading, if you're reading systematically through the Bible, reading a whole book here or a whole book there, you'll discover that God will take you to a chapter and the passages at a time when you're needing them. Amen. Amen. Jesus took the temperature of a church and he found them to be lukewarm. Do you think that they knew that they were lukewarm? Were they hypocrites? Because some people do know they're lukewarm. They know. And they try their best not to give it away, but they know. Yeah, I don't read my Bible. I, I, I pay attention when the pastor's preaching. That's my Bible reading every Sunday. And then I have no intention to read my Bible either. I'm not going to go ahead and get that carried away. But they go to church and act like they're all whole and active and alive and dynamic. And they're not. They're just hypocrites. Or maybe they didn't know that they were lukewarm. They didn't know. They were actually blind and foolish. They thought that going to church every Sunday was how you'd be a power Christian. Of course I'm a power Christian. The devil's scared of me. I go to church every Sunday. That's called blind and foolish. How about you? Are you lukewarm? How would you know? We can go to James chapter 1. Amen. Starting in verse 21. Give me a second to get there. James chapter 1 verse 21. He says, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. That superfluity basically means excess. Lay apart all filthiness and all the excess of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. That sounds like the Bible. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, He's like unto a man who beholds his natural face in a glass or a mirror. For he beholds himself and he goes his way and straightway forgets what manner of man he was. He forgot he had a smudge on his face. He forgot he had a cowlick standing up in the back of his head. He forgot that he had something in his teeth. He saw, he saw the errors, he saw the blemishes, and he walks away forgetting. That's a person who looks in the mirror does nothing about it. Someone who reads the Bible, sees the challenge, and lets it pass by. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, he not being a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Amen? Amen. Amen. He tells us what we need to do. There's two things you want to do if you want to be on fire. Amen. One, read the word of God. And secondly, obey the word of God. Amen. Amen. This is two very, very important things. If you don't want to be deceived, if you want to be alive and alert and awake and know whether you're lukewarm or not, read the word. 
Jesus said, search the scriptures. Paul said, walk by faith and not by sight. This is fire. This is hot. Amen. Now, if you don't obey, well, first of all, you can't obey what you don't read. You can't. If you're not reading the word, you can't obey it. You can't live by faith if you don't know what you're supposed to do. That's called cold. But if you deceive yourself, if you read it, but don't obey it. Yeah, I know what's right, I know what's wrong. I just don't do it. But I feel comfort in knowing that I know what's right and what's wrong. So anytime I want, I can start doing what's right and I know I'll be safe. But at the moment, today, I'm not gonna do what's right. I can do it tomorrow, because I know where it is. That's called lukewarm. What's the level of your spiritual passion? Does it result in spiritual action? Now, it can be scary to walking by faith. It really can be sometimes. So I acknowledge that. Maybe you've been scared away from doing the right decision because there was an element of faith involved in it. And maybe you're afraid of crashing and burning, or maybe you're afraid someone's not gonna, someone's gonna say something about you, and you're worried about the praise of man. But I'm going to say that, you know, it takes a little fear to be courageous. Yes. You can't be courageous if there's no fear. And so I encourage you, be courageous. Again, it's going to be scary. I acknowledge that and I salute you. you got to do what's right, amen. And you're going to find confidence after a couple successes. You're going to say, you know, this is easier than I expected. This is more effective than I expected. I'm growing so much quicker than I expected. Amen. And you're going to want to keep doing it. Amen. You're going to get addicted to the ministry after a while. Amen. You're going to really find it exciting. And your friends are going to be shocked saying, wow, what happened to you? You're doing a little change here and a little change here and a little change here and a little change here. And they actually see the big change. You don't see the big change, but they see the big change. Amen. God is doing a work in you. Step by step, day by day, if you let him do it. Amen? And that's fire. That is fire. Amen. And nothing more exciting than fire. In fact, people like to gather around a fire and watch things on fire. So catch on fire. Amen? Catch on fire. Let people see what God can do through you. Let God be glorified through your life of confidence and faith and scary intimidating memories. Now I'm afraid that we have a low view of the spiritual man. A low view of the spiritual man. What we would consider radical faith and activity. Radical. You might say, oh that person's a radical Christian. I believe the Bible would consider that person to be a normal Christian. What we consider to be radical Christianity, radical faith, the Bible, I believe, considers to be normal faith and normal activity. And what we consider to be normal and minimal faith and activity, the Bible considers probably almost backslidden. That's what I'm afraid. I'm afraid we've actually adopted what the world has adopted, a very casual approach to Christianity. Many churches are very, 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 they actually, they actually praise themselves and how casual how cool they are and how how unoffensive to the world they are and how much they can do that the world does that is almost there's no difference and we even though we're apostolics and pentecostals can look at these people and say well if that's their version of christianity all we got to do is just be a little bit harder than them and we're radical but we're not radical we're actually at that level, you know, what the Bible would consider, what Paul would consider, and Peter would consider almost backslidden. So we got to make sure we don't fall into a very casual Christian walk and say, well, you know, if I go to church every Sunday, I must be powerful, I must be hot, I must be radical. I go every Sunday. And that's what Peter and Paul would say, well, someone who just goes to church on Sunday, that's all they do? Let's pray for that person. <laughs> So let's lift the bar a little bit on what a normal Christian is. Take a look at Romans 12. We read this, we get a little bit challenged by it, then we read on, and the challenge goes away. 
He says in Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 1, he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, what God's done for you, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable, reasonable service. You know, some people say, well, you know, I'm happy to give God my mind, okay? I'll accept Jesus and I'll adopt him into my world. I'll believe God, but it's not going to have any impact upon my body. I'll dress the way I want. I'll live the way I want. I'll do whatever, you know, piercings and tattoos. I'll do this and I'll do, I'll do with my body whatever I want. But he says, you know what? God actually is interested in your body too. He's actually looking for... Your sacrifice to God would be so much as like you actually come up here on the altar and, and offer yourself up as a living sacrifice. Yeah, you're happy to give God your death, right? Well, God wants you to give you your life too. And that's not radical. That's not crazy Christianity. That's called my reasonable service. Amen. Amen. And he says, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So now we're going to the inside. First he says, give all your body. Now give all your mind and let it be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That now you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He says, I kind of expect you, God's expecting you, and I'm begging you to follow through this. Become a mature Christian. Have, having read your Bible, having read your New Testament several times, you'll be able to tell right from wrong without being able to find a verse for it, because you'll know the mind of Christ. You'll know how God thinks, you'll know how God, what principles make things good, what principles make things bad. Amen. And that's not radical. That's normal, that's reasonable. Jesus even gave a parable. When I first read it, I was so stunned. I thought I can't lose this verse. This is challenging me, and I can go on and, and get, let it get lost in the book of Luke somewhere and never see it again, but I need to remember where this is. I need to remember what kind of sacrifice God is expecting of me. Luke 17, starting in verse 7. And which of you, having a servant plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he has come in from the field, come in at once and sit down. You've been working hard. But will you not rather say to him, prepare something for me for my supper, and gird yourself, and serve me till I have eaten and drunk, and afterwards you can eat and drink. Amen. This is talking about a paid employee. He said, you don't serve your paid employees, they serve you. And they serve you until you're finished. You're paying them. They serve you, and they serve you, and they serve you. He said, does he... Thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I think not. So likewise you, when you have done those things which you were commanded to do, say this. We are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. In other words, if you have an incredible ministry, you worked hard at something, and you labored, and there was incredible fruit, Say, you know what? That was my duty. That's my reasonable service to God. That's not my radical service to God. That's my reasonable service to God. And I want you to have experiences like that. I want you to teach a home Bible study. You teach the first one and you bring in a little form. Someone says, I, you know, you taught a Bible study to me. You share the word of God with them. Whether they get saved or not, you've done something good. But you can come in and say, you know what? Ah, don't, don't praise me for it. That's my reasonable duty. That's not me, that's Jesus in me. Amen. Let Jesus get the glory for all that you do. Amen. We need to actually allow ourselves to realize that God's bar for service in his kingdom is pretty high. Normal is pretty high. And we need to rise up to it. We need to evaluate the degree of our spiritual passion and turn up the heat concerning our living for God. The only way to live for God is that is acceptable to him the only way to live for God that is acceptable to him is to be passionate and totally consumed with the kingdom we were born again into the kingdom and we're left on the earth 
Not so we can go through all the experiences everybody else experiences, but I want to get married, I want to have babies, I want to do this, I want to do that. The only reason God doesn't rapture us when we get born again is so we can share the gospel with others so they can get born again. Amen. Amen. It's a perk that we get to enjoy things like having babies and, and getting married and, and buying that first house or getting that car and, and the, all the achievements, getting that raise at work and all those achievements of life that make life fun. That's, that's not why you're left behind. The reason why you're here is so that you can share the word of God and reach other people. You have such incredible knowledge that can transform lives and change people's eternities. If it was medicine, and if we didn't share the medicine, what would people think of us? What would our boss think of us? If we had incredible medicine that could heal diseases, and we kept it in our back pocket, and we went to church, and we went home, went to church, went home, and didn't share the medicine. Amen. So we need to be that church that does something a lot more. Because God wants us to be on fire for Him. Amen. He, he, uh, uh, the lukewarm and a half-hearted Christian is disgusting and intolerable to the Lord because he recognizes only absolute dedication. I want to read that again. A lukewarm and half-hearted Christian is disgusting and intolerable to the Lord because he recognizes only absolute dedication. Now, you don't need to become a monk or a nun. You don't need to become that in the apostolic faith. You don't need to give up the, the goals of marriage. You give up goals of having babies and give up any other aspirations but we need to actually do all that while we're living for Jesus amen can you imagine being so distasteful to God that you literally make him sick I couldn't imagine that I couldn't imagine going to bed at night thinking life's good my walk with God is good and in reality my life made God sick that would be the greatest of, of shocks to my system and the most disturbing thought about this is that maybe you're in this condition at this very moment. You make God sick with your casual Christianity and don't know it. So for the few of you out there who might be doing that ignorantly, I want to wake you up. I want to give you a chance. I want to give you a chance to shake it. Shake yourself to wake yourself. Amen. Now the worst thing you can say to yourself at this moment is, well, that's not me. You're not talking about me. What did the apostles say when Jesus said, one of you will betray me? What did they say? Did they say, Lord, is it Judas? No. Did they say, well, that's not me. I can think of at least one other person who's worse off than me. So I'm safe. Amen. Hey, Christians do that. Some Christians think, okay, I'm okay. As long as I can think of someone in church that the pastor admires, and I'm better than them, then I know that I'm okay. Now, I can't remember who it was, it might have Paul said that people are comparing themselves against themselves, and which is the worst thing you can possibly do. Amen. Amen. We need to compare ourselves to what God's expecting from us. Amen. What did the apostles say? They gave a healthy response. They said, Lord, is it I? And I bet they all bothered him with that question, except one. I bet there was one who didn't ask that question because he was afraid he might say, yeah, probably. Or maybe he knew he was going to say yes. But I believe they said, Lord, is it I? And that is healthy. It's healthy. Say, Lord, is it me? Are you talking about me? In 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Paul said, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. That's why we have communion. Communion is a great chance to remind you to examine yourself. Now hopefully, if you're a nice, very concerned Christian about this whole topic, you probably test yourself on a regular basis. You're probably examining yourself. You're probably examining maybe sometimes everything you do. You might be a little bit too, too zealous in examining yourself. But that is actually healthier than somebody who says, well, it's not me. I know I'm fine, I'm not even going to check. 
or compare or test or anything because I just figure I'm, I'm doing good. I can think of three people in church who are worse off than me and the pastor thinks they're safe. So I've got to be in. You know, that's the worst thing we can do. We need to examine ourselves and test ourselves. And in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul also said again, just before he gave communion, he says, but let a man examine himself and let, so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So I believe that's one of the best things communion can do for us is it gives us a reminder to stop, look at ourselves, and try to be as honest as possible. Try not to be too hard when you start hating yourself and loathing everything you do. And try not to be too easy. It's like, oh, I, I am saying, well, we're all humans. So that's okay, too. Amen. We need to be just right there sort of in the middle and say, what would Jesus say if he was to look at me? Would he say, hey, you're hot. I like it. Or would he say, you are lukewarm this month. Man, you are making me sick. Try to be honest. Try to be honest because you know, a reminder to, to, to turn up the temperatures a little bit is always a good, healthy thing. Amen. It should be a regular practice in our prayer lives to check our spiritual temperature with holy fear and humility, evaluating our condition. Now, what are some traits you would expect of a lukewarm Christian? Well, how would you know a lukewarm Christian if you saw one? Well, lukewarm Christians don't read the Bible. They might read it once a week. But they're not regularly reading the Bible. The, 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 the prayer says, Lord, give me this day our daily bread. Amen. We need God's word very much. We need God's word to make it through the day. They don't read the Bible. They get their scripture from the Sunday sermon. They get their scripture from the Christian music that their, their brother or sister listens to. Or their husband or wife listens to. Not praying regularly. But only when they're concerned about something. When someone gets sick, oh, yeah, it's time to pray. Youth camp, it's time to pray. You know, general conference, oh, I'm on fire. You know, that's not, that's not a strong Christian. A strong Christian prays every day. Amen. Tries to pray every day. Amen. Makes a commitment, makes a concern out of it, you know. Um, but a, a, a lukewarm Christian is someone who hasn't brought anyone to church and never witnesses in the workplace. They haven't brought anyone to church. Never witness in the workplace. I mean, as a Christian, I thought the only reason God allowed me to have a car is so I can bring people to church. That's it. That's the only reason. And if I'm not going to bring people to church, I need to walk to work. That's, that's how I felt God would view the whole situation. So if I had a car, it was a car so I can bring people to church. Lukewarm people, Christians, lukewarm Christians are critical against church leaders. They judge members of the church. They're stubborn and unteachable. Amen. Those are traits of a lukewarm Christian. Not reading the Bible, not praying regularly, haven't brought anyone to church, never witnessed at the workplace, critical, judgmental, stubborn, unteachable. But what are some traits you would expect from someone who's on fire? Well, they're reading their Bible regularly, and anyone can do that. You can do that. Don't think, oh, I wish I could do that. I'm not really a reader. You can do that. Even if you just turn on an app and listen to the scriptures every day. I love it. You know, my wife, she puts the scriptures on her iPad. And, and, uh, and I'll be brushing my teeth, hearing the scriptures. And um, at nighttime, go to sleep and the thing's still on. And I'll, I'll be listening for a while. Then I go and turn it off. I kind of enjoy listening to the scriptures as well. I'm a reader type. But I've discovered how much I enjoy listening. Amen. And it's just as impactful because actually in the early days, in the days of the early church, people didn't really read as much. They listened. Someone read, everybody else listened. Reading was more of a verbal practice. It was a verbal activity, not necessarily a quiet. In fact, even if you were reading by yourself, you were reading out loud. That's how people read back in the old days. They read out loud. Reading quietly was a very odd skill back in those days. Okay, so a person who's on fire reads the Bible every day. Now, the only reason why anyone would read the Bible every day is because they wanted to. The only reason why you want to read the Bible every day is because you want to. If you don't read the Bible every day, it's probably because, not you're not too busy, it's because you don't want to. Because you'll find time to do what you want to do. 
You'll find time to do what you want to do. That person will have a consistent prayer life, interceding for others, lifting other people up, seeking wisdom and power and direction from God. Amen. Prayer is more than just telling God what to do. Prayer is more than just saying, you know, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You can intercede for others. You can pray for others and lift them up. There's lots of people going through hard times right now. Families who've lost people and people who are struggling. People who are sick. We're praying for Sister Giselle. Our good friend who had a stroke recently. Amen. Lots of people are praying for Sister Giselle and her family. And, and also for ourselves, we can pray for wisdom and power. And most especially, what direction to point all that wisdom and power in. Amen. Lord, what do you want me to do? What's the best thing I can do? What's the best career choice I can use to, to reach the most people? What's the best um, way I can do things? And these people who are on fire, they are sharing the word of God with friends and co-workers and they're bringing visitors to church. Amen. Does it sound like you? Would you like it to sound like you? Because you can do that. You can. This is not rocket science. Amen. You can do this. If you're not doing it, this is open for you. You can do it. You really can. I want you to understand, you don't have to be born a super Christian. You don't have to be a certain kind of person. You don't have to be smart or big with words or strong in English. You don't need anything. Anyone can be on fire for God. You can read your Bible daily. You can connect with Jesus daily. Praying, and you can share with others what you're learning. Amen. You can do that. Let's all stand. Amen. If the fire of the Holy Ghost will ignite us as saints of God, it will kindle a blaze of revival that will compare to no other revival in history. We can have it start right here in the northern beaches. Amen. Yeah, that little church. Yeah, we can do something. We can catch this place on fire and show all the other churches how to do it. Let's become what God wants us to become and what the world needs us to become. Amen. Christians on fire. Amen. Let's check our temperature today. Let's repent of lukewarm Christianity. Let's catch on fire. Let's let God's favor and attention as we seek his faith and we witness the lost and we walk by faith in holy dedication. Amen. And then let's all do this together. Let's leave nobody behind. Amen. Let's encourage each other. Let's inspire each other. Amen. Chase some people down this week and teach them a Bible study. Even if you don't know much of the Bible, all you got to do is read it with them. Can you read it with them at least? And as you read it, because of your little bit of knowledge more than what they have, you can explain things that might be a little vague. Or if you don't know, you can circle something and say, I'll ask about that. I'll come back to you and get an answer. And nothing better than that. That's even great because now you have a, a second chance to touch base with them. And of course, you'll get the answer. Amen. So I encourage you, please don't let anything stop you from teaching the home Bible study. All you can do is read it with them, discover it with them, explain it to them. And you're exposing them to the Word of God, the life-transforming gospel of Jesus Christ. And you're giving them a chance to say yes. In fact, when I was talking to Antonio and Bilda that one day, I didn't say I want to baptize you. I said, would you like to be baptized? I asked a question. I went in and I said, you know what, today, I really feel like I should ask a question. And so I remind you, the last question in that booklet is the question. Would you like to give your life to God and be baptized today? Let God do the work. You don't have to be talented. You don't have to be clever. You don't have to be smart or a good salesperson. God will do the work. Amen. You plant. You water, someone else will water it, God brings the increase. You'll be so excited seeing that first person coming and giving your life to God. And you're going to say, wow, how did I get involved in that? How did God allow me to be a part of that miracle? You'll be humbled. You'll be humbled when people's lives change and you had something to do with it. you wonder, how did I get involved in that? God is good. He's good. Amen. We'll say goodbye to our online guests. God bless you. Thanks for joining us. Amen.